Hallelujah, hallelujah. Are you thankful for the presence of the Lord in the house this morning? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, it is so awesome to feel his presence. Hallelujah. Our world is full of people with addictions because they're seeking after what you feel in the house this morning. There is an emptiness in man's heart that can only be filled by God. And I am so thankful to be in his presence this morning to feel what my heart needs. Hallelujah, can you say amen? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. We appreciate, so thankful for the outstanding performance, uh, the job our worship team has done leading us into the presence of the Lord this morning. Can you say amen? Hallelujah, hallelujah. It's good to be in his presence. Hallelujah. I'm glad you're here this morning. Hallelujah. I know uh, some had uh, some difficult trips getting here. Some of us had to do a little walking to get here, but I'm glad I'm in the house of the Lord this morning. Hallelujah. Amen, amen, amen. Hallelujah. We're going to dismiss our teen class at this time. Hallelujah. We want to give honor to Pastor Anthony, the elders, Brother Seitz. Hallelujah. And all the saints of the Most High in the house this morning. Hallelujah. If you have your Bible, I'm going to take a text out of 1 Samuel. 1 Samuel chapter 13 and also 1 Samuel chapter 15. Hallelujah. 1 Samuel chapter 13 beginning at verse 8. Reads, And he tarried seven days according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel came not to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. And Saul said, Bring hither a burnt offering to me, and peace offerings. And he offered the burnt offering. And it came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of the offering, the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might salute him. And Samuel said, What hast thou done? What hast thou done? Turning over to chapter 15, verse 13. And Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said unto him, Blessed be thou the Lord, I have performed the commandments of the Lord. And Samuel said, What meaneth then this bleeding of the sheep in mine ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? By the help of the Lord this morning, I want to preach. Horseshoes and hand grenades. Horseshoes and hand grenades. Elder Jared, we ask the Lord's blessing this morning. Hallelujah. Give the Lord a hand praise as you're seated this morning. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I feel the Holy Ghost here this morning. Hallelujah. Can you help me preach this morning? We have the story of King Saul from his call to his fall. Israel had desired a king so they could be like everybody else. That's our first problem when you want to be like everybody else. The Apostle Paul said, follow me as I follow Christ. The problem is too many times the church wants to follow what the media says. Let me tell you, the only roadmap you need to be following is what's in the book today. 
Don't worry about what anybody else says. Don't worry about what anybody else thinks. Don't worry about what you read on the internet. Don't worry about what you see on the television. Worry about what's in the book. The scripture says that Saul was a son of Kish. He was a good looking man. The scripture says that there was none like him in all of Israel. He was head and shoulders above everyone else. He was a tall man. He was a valiant man. He led Israel to victory in many battles. There was none like Saul. He looked the part, but what really mattered was in his heart. We need to check our heart. We need to check our heart this morning. We find here in, from our text in chapter 13, we find that the Philistines came up and camped at Mishmash against Israel because Jonathan had gone down and whipped the garrison of the Philistines, made them mad. And the scripture says that the Philistines came up with 30,000 chariots, 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand on the seashore. And the scripture records that Saul had 2,000 men. Jonathan had 1,000 men. Now, they were camped at Mishmash. Mishmash means to store away, to lay up in store in your memory. You see, when you have a victory, when you have a victory, the enemy's going to come right back. Don't think just because you had a victory last Sunday that the devil's going to leave you alone because I promise you, the devil will come right back at your door. He will come right back and lay seeds around you. But you just remember what you laid up in memory, what you laid up in store when you had that victory. The Lord is with me. The Lord is on my side. I will stand strong. I will abide with him. Saul asked, what are we going to do? You see, because Samuel had told Saul to go down to Gilgal and you wait there seven days. You do what I said. You go wait seven days and I'll show up. And we'll offer burnt offerings to the Lord, and the Lord is going to see you through. Now, the scripture records that on the seventh day, Saul got nervous. He got nervous because the scripture says that the people were scattered from him, and, and he was afraid Samuel wasn't going to show up. He doubted the man of God. He doubted the word of God. He doubted and reasoned with himself that God didn't really mean what he said. Let me challenge you this morning. Read the book. Read the book. And I promise you, God means what he said. God does not change his mind. It is recorded. Thy word, O Lord, is settled forever in heaven. Saul took matters into his own hand, and it was all downhill from there. When we try to do everything ourselves, instead of abiding by the word, things tend to go downhill quick. He took matters into his own hands and offered to sacrifice himself. The scripture records that just as soon as he got done, Immediately afterwards, Samuel came and said, what have you done? You ever get in trouble? Surely all of us as a kid growing up got in trouble a few times and mom and dad walked in and said, what have you done? That's where we, we find Saul here. Basically, Saul told him, he said, I was afraid you wasn't coming. I didn't think you were going to come through. And so I decided to go ahead and, and do things my own way. When we do things our own way, it gets us into trouble. Samuel responded by saying, Thou hast done foolishly. Thou hast not kept the commandment of the Lord, which the Lord thy God, he commanded thee, for now... 
would the Lord have established thy kingdom upon Israel forever, but now thy kingdom shall not continue. The Lord hath sought him a man after his own heart. There is an extremely sad occurrence that happens right here. There is a sad omission right here in the story. Read it for yourself in 1 Samuel chapter 13. You will not find where Samuel or where Saul repented. Saul did not repent. He should have fallen on his face in repentance. He should have asked God to create in me a clean heart, renew a right spirit within me. But he didn't. Nowhere is recorded that Saul said, I'm sorry. I messed up. Please forgive me. He didn't ask for forgiveness. Instead, he continued on down the road in arrogance and contempt, thumbing his nose at God. Now, where do we get off thinking we can do what we want, live any way we want, participate in any lifestyle after all that God has done for us? I don't know about you. I feel some obligation in my life. God has been good to me. He has been merciful to me. He has forgiven me over and over again. There's been times I've fallen, skinned my knees. There's been times I've fallen and busted my nose. And God has had mercy on me. He has forgiven me. He has set me up on the rock again. I feel an obligation to do my best to live for him. Where do we get off saying it doesn't matter what God done for me, I'm still going to do what I want to do? How do we allow this reprobate, humanistic thinking to persuade us that the Bible doesn't really mean what it says? Just Just because God hadn't struck you down doesn't mean he's pleased with your lifestyle. Just because somebody's living in sin up to their ears doesn't mean God's pleased with their lifestyle. Just because they ain't dead yet. If we move over a couple chapters to chapter 15, we find that Saul being commanded to go up against the Amalekites and to destroy them completely. Get rid of them. They attacked Israel when, they, when, when Israel was weak, and I didn't forget. God doesn't forget. God said, I want you to go down there and wipe them all out. No mercy. I want you to kill men and women, the young, the old. I want you to kill all the sheep, all the oxen. Whatever's there, I want you to wipe them off the face of the earth. There's some times that you need to destroy some things out of your life. Don't leave any remnant. Don't leave anything hanging around. When God says wipe it out, wipe it out. Get it out. We find that when Saul and his army went up to battle, that God gave them great victory. And they destroyed everything. Well, almost, almost everything, almost anyway. Samuel came and and saw, saw the prophet coming. And he said, behold, I have performed the commandment of the Lord. Samuel asked, if you destroyed everything, then what meaneth the bleeding of the sheep and the lowing of the oxen that I hear? Okay, okay, all right. Now, this, so he left a few of the best sheep. He left a few of the best sheep and the oxen, and he left the king Agag. 
but, but he was going to offer the livestock for a sacrifice to the Lord. I mean, stop and think about it. He, he did what he was supposed to do, didn't he? Didn't he? I, I mean, he did it almost. He, he, was, he almost done what he, what he was supposed to, didn't he? I mean, isn't that the way we look at things? Samuel said, Hath the Lord as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord. Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice and to hearken than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft and stubbornness. Stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. But what's the big deal? I mean, Saul was a good guy, right? He was fighting on the right side. He had it all going for him. He, he was good looking. He, he was strong. He was big. He was called of God. He was a leader. He was obeying the voice of God. Almost. Almost. Verse 25 records where Saul besought the prophet Samuel and said, Turn again with me and worship with me in the sight of the people and the elders. It was all about appearance. It was all about what it looked like. Do I still look like I'm a Christian? Do I, do I still look the part? Do I still look like I'm apostolic? But I must ask, what's in my heart? What is driving me? Is it a desire to seek people's approval of my life? Is that what's driving me? Or is it a desire to please God? Is it a desire to, to line up to what's in the book? Is that what's driving me? Almost, almost, he could have had his kingdom established forever. Almost. How important is it to be right? I've got this sign. It sits on the shelf in my office. Almost right is wrong. In my job, like Brother Bill, if you're almost right, you can get somebody killed. How important is it to be right? I remember my freshman year in college taking an engineering mechanics class. And uh, you had these problems. That's how you, you learn to do the calculations, uh, like that holds up a bridge. Strengths of members and moments of inertia. Statics, dynamics. And at the beginning of every class, the professor would take up the homework from the previous assignment and he would take one question and explain it from that homework because he would also pass back what he gave back the, the previous class and then he would take one question out of what he passed back and explain it before going on to the next lesson and I remember vividly getting the homework back and one boy asking I've got a question about number two all right, we'll go through it. And he goes through all the math on the board. And he's calculating and figuring everything. And he got done, and the boy said, he said, well, professor, i, I got to ask a question. He said, you didn't give me any, even partial credit 
and I did everything you did. All I did was miss a sign. As in a positive or a negative. He said, all I did was miss a sign. You would have thought he said something about that professor's mother. He went crazy. He went to yelling, and he had you would fold your paper long ways like this. That's the way you would turn in your, that's the way he wanted it folded, turned into your homework. And he had that stack that he just uh, had taken up. And he went running, there's a football player sitting on the front row. He went over to that football player and he said, take this stack, take it, take it. He said, pull it half in two, pull it half in two. And the old boy's like, I can't pull it in two. He said, how about you, you're a big boy, pull it half in two. And he said, no, I can't do it that way. And then he went up to the front of the, and stood him up on end. He said, well, who wants to stand on him? Crush. He said, that, mister, is the difference in missing a sign, whether your bridge stands or whether it falls into the river. That's the difference of why it is important to be right. Almost right is still wrong. Almost right is still wrong, and it'll still send your soul to hell. It is important to be right. It is important to line up with what's in the book. How do you know how long something is? You measure it. But how do you know if your measurement is accurate? How long is a meter? There are some people that really care about accuracy. In 1889, the International Bureau of Weights and Measures established the International Prototype Meter. They put two marks on a stick. They're actually a bar of 90% platinum and 10% iridium and made that the distance of standardizing the meter, the standard by which all meter sticks would be calibrated. These two marks were supposed to be a simpler way of standardizing the meter. After that, the meter was defined by the French Academy of Sciences as one ten millionth of a quadrant of the Earth's circumference running through the North Pole to Paris to the equator. In 1960, the standard became even more exact as... 1,650,763.73 wavelengths of the light in a vacuum of the red-orange line in the spectrum of the Krypton-86 atom. Nowadays, a true meter is defined as the distance traveled in that same gas in the light in a vacuum in 1, 299,792,458 of a second. Now, science and technology are becoming more exacting in the way they measure their standards. Pretty strange, don't you think, that at the same time, the rest of the world is casting off its social, moral, educational, and Christian standards. Why is it science wants to get more exact, but the world and God help us, sometimes the church wants to get a little sloppy? On that measuring stick back in 1889, why didn't they use aluminum or PVC? Why didn't they use that to make a standard meter? Because it changes with its environment. These items tend to expand and contract. You lose your precise mark and measure. If you take a piece of PVC pipe and put it out in the sunshine or in the fire, it'll move and it'll stretch and it'll change its shape. It'll get soft until sometimes you can't even tell what it used to be. Church, we cannot allow ourselves to become like these inferior materials. We cannot change with our circumstances. We cannot say that almost is good enough. We must be pure. We've got to be what he wants us to be. We've got to be like him. We've got to measure up. We've got to be right. We must line up with the book. Not just almost. The measurement of weights have equally exacting standards. One of the oldest forms of thievery was shaving the weights. 
It used to be that merchants measured grain by using weights and counterbalances and customers who thought they were getting a pound of grain would be cheated because the one pound counterweights had been shaved down so it weighed just a little bit less than a true pound. Proverbs said that a false balance is an abomination to the Lord but a just weight is his delight. He wants us to be right. One of the characteristics of this generation is that people want to shave the weights and lower the standards. God and His Word are absolute and unchangeable. They are the standard of what is right and what is wrong. When you take God out of the equation of life, it affects a lot more than just your Sunday morning. Everything changes. Eventually you come to believe that there is no right or wrong. You're just living in a world with shades of gray. There was news this week that I came across of a former megachurch pastor. And uh, he was asked by Oprah Winfrey about a certain subject. And he said that, uh, he said that the culture is ready to embrace homosexuality and same-sex marriage. And if the church hopes to stay relevant, it must accept those relationships and stop looking to the Bible as its best defense. He went on to answer the question, are the churches ready to accept homosexuality and same-sex marriages? This so-called preacher... I use the term extremely loosely. Somebody ain't got a backbone is not a preacher. He said they are close and warned that if they don't, they will become even more irrelevant than before. I think culture is already there and the church will continue to be even more irrelevant when it quotes letters from 2,000 years ago as its best defense. Let me tell you, my Bible says heaven and earth shall pass away, but my word shall stand forever. When the world is on fire, what's in that book is still going to be true, and it will still remain relevant. If you don't know if something's a sin, look in the book. If you don't know where to find it, come and ask me. I'll show you. He went on to ask if this popular person was a Christian. And he said, that word has so much baggage. Baggage. You're telling me for me to want to live a life that says I am like Jesus Christ is baggage? Let me tell you. He ain't heavy. He ain't heavy. My Bible says take up your cross and follow him. Straight is the gate. Narrow is the way that leads to life everlasting. I'm not going to stand here and tell you that I am perfect. But let me tell you, I'm sure doing my best. It don't take me long to find my knees, Brother Price, when I know I've messed up. Say, God, you got to forgive me. you got to wash me clean. I need your help because I want to live for you. We live in a world where almost, almost is becoming good enough. What is the minimum I have to do and get by? Let me tell you, if we forsake the word, we're no better off than the moose. If we forsake the word, we're no better off than any other social club.
what's the minimum I have to do to get by? It's what the world says. And unfortunately, this kind of low-level thinking is carried over into the church. Too often, we ask ourselves, because Lord knows we'd never say it out loud. What's the least I can do and still be a Christian? What's the least I can have to do and still be apostolic? What do I got to do? Well, let me tell you what Paul said. He said, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And he said, be not conformed to this world. I don't care what's popular. I don't care what the world is throwing out there, what kind of garbage you hear on the radio, read on the Internet, see on the television. It's garbage. I'm going to live for God. I want to live and measure up to the book. He said, and be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. We must aim for the perfect will of God. Minimum standard seeking has become a problem for the church just as it has for the rest of the world. can't fool anybody but yourself. Jesus sees the depths of our hearts and our motives and knows us better than we know ourselves. Those who are striving for the lowest calling may in the end be unhappily surprised. What if this Savior but not Lord category doesn't really exist see too many people are looking for a savior but they don't want a lord I want somebody to save me out of all this mess I get myself into I want somebody to save me make sure I don't go to hell but I don't know about doing all this stuff to please God all the time What's wrong with the heart of somebody who just wants to almost be where they should be with God? What's wrong with our heart? When you aim for the lowest level, you're probably going to hit it. When you aim for the lowest level, it shows that even though you may do a lot of good things, your heart's headed in the wrong direction. It takes more than just being a good person. It takes the blood of Jesus. Don't just aim for the permissible will of God if such a thing even exists. Seek God's perfect will in your life. Press for the mark. Will the musicians come? Horseshoes and hand grenades. It's a phrase for an analogy that we've come up with that says, almost is good enough. Almost is good enough. Why? Because if you throw a hand grenade, you don't have to hit your target directly, just get close. The same goes for horseshoes. Oh, yes, you get more points the closer you get, but usually close is good enough. Oh, I really don't have to dress in all that modest apparel to a pastor. Can't I just pitch a horseshoe and kind of get close? I don't really have to pay my tithes and give the offering, do I? I don't really have to worship with my, with my whole heart, do I? 
I don't really need to get involved in the worship in the church. So can't I just pitch another horseshoe? I really don't have to give my whole life, do I? I don't really have to give my whole heart to him, do I? Can't I just pitch another horseshoe? Do I really need to come to church all the time? Is it really all in in, in, in Christmas and Easter good enough? Maybe one Sunday a month? Can I just pitch another horseshoe and get close? Do I really need to listen to the preaching? Do I really need to know what's in the Word? Do I really need to live my life according to the Word? Do you mean I need to shun and, and turn off that garbage I hear out there that says all this stuff that's been sin all my life and now the world says it's okay? You mean it really doesn't matter? Can't I just pitch a hand grenade and get close? Let me tell you, church, we don't have hand grenades and this ain't horseshoes. It's the real thing. Almost ain't good enough. Almost is not going to get you into heaven. Almost won't get you through the pearly gates. God help us if on judgment day we stand before the Lord and he said you almost, you almost made it. I don't want to spend eternity saying I almost made it if I had only given my best, if I only given all of my heart. Could we stand? Every time we walk into an atmosphere that's different than what you feel here this morning. We feel worship. We feel the Holy Ghost in the house this morning. But every time you walk into an atmosphere that's different, we cannot change our measure. We can't vacillate back and forth to suit our surroundings. We must not be an expansion joint. We've got to be on the cornerstone, Jesus Christ. We've got to be on the firm foundation of God's Word. His word must get down on the inside of us and be established to make us exactly what he wants us to be. He doesn't want us to almost be Christians. He wants us to be altogether, totally sold out, pure Christians. And the greatest enemy, the greatest enemy to being the best is just being good. The Apostle Paul, the great Apostle Paul said, I press, I'm pushing. I'm striving towards the mark. If the Apostle Paul had to press and to struggle to be what God wanted him to be, God have mercy on me. That needs to be your prayer. God have mercy on me. Help me to be what I ought to be. We cannot allow ourselves to accept good enough until we're the best and we hear him say well done we must possess the drive we've got to strive to be the best God will allow us to be the old song used to say 99 and a half just won't do
we're not tossing hand grenades and we're not pitching horseshoes. I'm trying to be like Jesus. Are you trying to be like Jesus this morning? Come on, let's talk to him. God, touch me. Create in me a clean heart. Renew a right spirit with me in me, oh God. Help me, oh God, to be what you'd have me to be. Help me to line up to your word, Lord. Every jot, every tittle. Lord, I want to be pleasing to you in every aspect of my life. Watch me. Make me clean. Make me whole. God, I want to be about your business, oh Lord. Be used by you, oh Lord.